Good afternoon, welcome everyone. Let's get started with a small thought experiment. Imagine you had a crystal ball and you could look into the future, but you can only ask one question. What would you want to know? Well, one thing that I would want to know is what role plasma technology will play in the future CCU technology landscape. My name is Rani Vertonge and I'm a first year PhD student in the Plasma Research Group in Antwerp. Today, I'm going to show you the state of the art of plasma technology for gas conversion and how my research tries to make it more feasible for industrial CCU. Now, why do we want to convert CO2 in the first place? I think we all already know the answer to that. We as humans, we use fossil fuels and energy sources that eventually lead to the emission of CO2 a greenhouse gas that leads to global warming and unprecedented climate changes. Now, one way to break this linear chain is to use plasma technology to convert the CO2 into value-added chemicals and fuels. Why are we so interested in a plasma then? Well, a plasma is a very reactive environment. Um, this means that the electrons are accelerated by the applied electric field, um, and your electrons will actually activate the gas molecules and open up alternative reaction pathways so that you have a much more efficient dissociation compared to the conventional methods. This also means that your reactions can proceed at much milder conditions of lower temperatures and pressures. It's also a very flexible technology. You can modify both your, uh, your input gases or so your feedstock and your products depending on the needs of the process. And of course, a plasma runs on electricity. So this can help us get rid of our fossil fuel dependence. In addition to that, it's a very, um, it's a technology that is easily switched on and off, uh, which makes it easier to compare with renewable electricity. For example, if it's a very sunny day, you can switch on your plasma reactors quite quickly uh, to convert excess electricity from the solar panels into a fuel like methanol. Then uh, you can design your reactor as such um, that it can be a continuous flow, which is more interesting for industry. And typically uh, plasma reactors are upscaled in parallel, which means you have a linear upscaling, which is again easier for industry. OK, now I gave you this whole list. Um, this is actually not new. A lot of research about plasma for gas conversion has already been done. Then you might wonder, what am I doing here? Well, my goal is to take these plasma reactors that we already have and increase their performance, improve their performance by increasing both the CO2 conversion and the energy efficiency by using experiments and modeling. For this presentation, I will focus a bit more on the experimental side. OK, so let's have a look. This is an example of an experimental setup. So, of course, you have to start with your input gas, which can be pure CO2, or you can mix it, for example, with methane to do dry reforming. This gas then flows through a plasma reactor, which can be any kind of plasma reactor. We have many different types in our lab, and all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. And then in our group, we typically do some uh, diagnostics on the exhaust, like gas chromatography, NDIR, mass spectrometry, etc. Then we also need some kind of power to ignite and sustain the plasma. And to monitor this power, we also use an oscilloscope coupled to a high voltage probe and a resistor to um, yeah, monitor this power and calculate the efficiency of the process. So now you know what an experimental setup looks like. Let's have a look at some results. So this, for example, is the gap reactor or the gliding arc plasmatron. As you can see on the scheme on the left, uh, it has these tangential inlets through which the gas flows, um, and this stabilizes the arc in the center, so you get a central gliding arc. A few years ago, our group did a study with computational fluid dynamics, and this is a result that came out. So as you can see, because of the angle of the inlets, the gas really flows in in a vortex motion, and it forms a large outer vortex all the way into the body. But by the time it reaches the top, it loses some of its momentum and it flows back as a smaller um, reversed vortex to the outlets. In the same study, um, they also investigated the arc and it's actually it's exactly this flow pattern that stabilizes the arc in the center. So your plasma is really confined by the flow, by the flow, and then your gas can pass through it. 
And all these effects together leads to quite an efficient gas conversion for an atmospheric pressure plasma. Now, one thing uh, we wanted to study in the past is, can we improve the performance of this reactor if we vary the outlet time meter? The short answer is yes, we can. Um, as you can see on the graph on the left, there uh, I give the results of the CO2 conversion as a function of the specific energy input, which is a measure for the energy that is um, often used to compare different designs. And as you can see, actually, the smallest tiny meter, the 7 millimeter, leads to a much higher conversion for the exact same energy input. So clearly, these conditions are interesting. As a result, what you can see on the right, this also leads to a higher energy efficiency. There are a few conditions where the energy efficiency is higher, but the conversions in those cases are so low that these conditions are overall not so interesting. So our best results are a conversion of about 9% for an energy efficiency of about 30%, and this is related to the uh, outlet time meter. So these insights combined with the computational study that I showed you on the previous slide um, really demonstrated that um, the diameter is determining for the performance because actually the smaller the outlet time meter, well, the more your gas is forced in this vortex flow motion, it cannot just escape to the outlets. Bottom line, uh, the residence time of the gas in the plasma is much longer, which as a result leads to a higher conversion and a better efficiency. So this is all past work. That's when I came into the group and I thought, let's mix it up and let's just try some more exotic uh, electrode designs. On the left, you can see the default electrode design, uh, which was used in the previous results. But I tried many different variations of that. I tried a cone-shaped cathode. I tried to decrease the anode diameter even more. I even increased the anode into the volume of the cathode. Um, so many different variations. And the first results actually show that this has a huge effect. Um, as you can see, the design really determines the range of specific energy input that you can reach uh, with a reactor. And um, there are huge differences between them. There are also, most of them seem to be better than the default. Now, these, keep in mind, these results are only relative compared to each other. Um, this is still work in progress. We later discovered some issues with both the power measurement and with the calibration of the CO2. Um, but still, in my next experiment, I expect that these relative results will hold um, when I do the full experiment. Okay, what can we conclude? We see that actually the conversions uh, in atmospheric pressure reactors is all about maximum 15% for energy efficiencies of about 40% in the maximum. But I also saw that the design really has a large influence on both the power that can be achieved and on the residence time of the gas in the plasma. So clearly more improvements are still possible. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, at the moment, I'm doing experiments with the concept of gas recirculation, which is well known in industry, but actually barely investigated uh, for plasma reactors. So this already uh, gives some very promising results. This is still a work in progress. Um, we're also looking into product separation, for example, by means of putting a carbon bed behind the plasma. We're looking at preheating the gas before we send it to the reactor or quenching, so quickly cooling the gas after it comes out of the reactor. All this uh, is worth, all this and more actually is what we're investigating at the moment. But we also believe that we can get even more out of these technologies if we can find some collaborations within the capture network, for example. Um, catal the catalyst design of the post plasma region could be very interesting um, because then we could steer our products even more than we can right now. But on the, and then the second point that I want to make is. Um, I've been talking about yeah, bringing plasma technology to industry, but one way to actually investigate this would be to perform a techno-economical analysis. So if you have suggestions for collaborations or if you have questions later on, don't hesitate to contact me or Professor Bogaert. The contact details are on the slide. Okay, I'm very curious to see where all our projects, um, what the future brings for all these projects within the Capture Network. And I thank you very much for your attention.